there. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Steve Farrell. I'm a co-founder of Humanities Team. I am coming to you live from Boulder, Colorado in our studio here. And uh, look who I've got here with me today. Just uh, real excited about the hour in store, Barnett Bain. I'll give him a proper introduction in a moment. Uh, Barnett, thanks so much for being here with me. Good moment, everyone, where, wherever you are. All right, and uh, Barnett, you're coming in from uh, Southern California. Where Where are you again? I'm in uh, Malibu, where it's um, beautiful and snowing pollen. <laughs> All right, yeah, we got uh, got a good amount of pollen here in Boulder too. Boy, it is gorgeous this time of year. We're coming into spring, summer, and the fall. Uh, nothing like Boulder, Colorado, this time of year. But but then. Uh, Malibu, wow, you know, a lot of people move to Malibu that can afford to live down there, talking about a beautiful spot. So great to have you with us, and uh, big shout out to all of our friends here. Uh, first, I want to wave at the people in the studio. I can see some of you on camera. Thank you for being on camera. We've got ourselves a live audience, which makes it uh, a whole lot of fun. Also, to, to friends just out on social media, on Facebook, on, uh, on YouTube, uh, John Raymer and Sign Dot Network. Uh, so big shout out to all of you guys. Thank you for being with us today. Again, we have a, just a fantastic program in store. Barnett and I were in the green room before coming on, uh, talking about uh, different things, and we we could have an, a, a day long conversation. We're going to condense it to an hour uh, and get to just a lot of great stuff. This is a live program, so if you've got things that you want to get to Barnett, be sure to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll uh, grab those and we'll bring questions to Barnett before the hour is over. Um, okay, so our theme here today is, uh, is gaining creative mastery. Gaining creative mastery. And we're going to think about creativity in a whole new way. And that's part of what we're going to discuss here during the hour. Boy, Barnett is going to, whatever your thoughts about creativity are, get ready for the bookends to get moved out because <laughs> uh, it's going to happen. Uh, it is, uh, uh, Barnett is amazing. So let me, let me share his bio here real quick. Barnett Bain is a visionary Canadian filmmaker, author, and educator, has made significant contributions to cinema and spirituality. His notable works include directing and writing Milton's Secret, based on Eckhart Tolle's teachings, producing the Oscar-winning What Dreams May Come, and contributing as a writer and producer to The Celestine Prophecy. In addition to filmmaking, Barnett has served as core faculty member at Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Teachers College, Columbia University, the first Ivy League master's concentration in spirituality and psychology. His creativity workshops inspire individuals across all backgrounds to unlock their potential and consciously craft their desired lives. So how cool is that? And uh, thanks again for being with us, Barnett. Uh, looking forward here. <laughs> Always. All right. Always. So um, usually, you know, I like to kind of jump in. Uh, I want, I, I like to um, sort of talk about background. But in this case, we have three video clips that are so incredibly thought provoking that I want to begin with one. Uh, and then and then Barnett and I are going to come back and talk about it. Uh, and so and again, we've got three of them. And then we have a lot of other things that uh, we want to talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll even share as a preview. So years ago, when we were, it's like five, seven years ago, I was talking to Barnett on Zoom. And uh, Barnett says, you know, we're in the age of consciousness. Uh, I, I believe he, you know, I hadn't heard anybody uh, frame the current age as the age of consciousness until, until Barnett shared this. I believe it's true. I believe we're in it. And uh, lots happening. We'll, we'll get to that here, too in our discussion here during the hour. Let's go to this video clip, and then uh, we're going to come back and talk about it and, and just fly into uh, an incredible discussion about creativity in its fullest sense. Here we go. So creativity, why does it matter? The conventional wisdom is that creative intelligence is limited to the arts, that you have to be a writer, a painter, whatever, that there are limited outlets for creative energy. That's one worldview. Here's mine. Everything is a process of creativity. 
Okay, maybe you're not so interested in creating a circus or a symphony. How about a satisfying relationship or meaningful work? How about a business, which is probably the number one expression of creativity in America? Every thought or feeling or choice you have is a creative act. Everything you can see, feel, touch, remember, or imagine is part of your being. You create it all. We are always creating all the time. There's nothing else happening ever. And letting in the truth of that has the power to change what you think, what you do, and what you say. There are other reasons that creativity is worth our attention. To meet the challenges of a world quickly becoming new, challenges with too few apparent solutions, and ultra or evolutionary creativity has to be awakened. Fortunately, it can be awakened. We can all become weapons of mass creation. For some, this will be a pastime or hobby. For others, maybe it'll be a vocation. For still others, part of the great work of responding to the unfolding of a new paradigm that's awakening. But for everyone, pastime, vocation, or great worker, up-level creativity is a birthright. Okay, weapons of mass creativity and uh, that uh, this, this is a birthright. So, wow, those are ones for the refrigerator. <laughs> uh, let me share, as we begin talking, too, uh, Barnett and James Twyman created a masterclass. It's on the Humanity Stream Plus platform now. It's called Creative Mastery. So it's got uh, the normal uh, 16 modules and mentoring and all of that, Creative Mastery. For all of you here in the studio, boy, go dig in. Uh, these modules are amazing. Uh, we're going to only be able to skim the surface here during the hour. Uh, if you want to really go deep into, into creative mastery, which is Barnett shares in that clip, uh, you know, most of us aren't directors and producers. We don't, that's, that's not our line of business, but we're living a life. <laughs> and uh, we can live a lot fuller life where we get more creative. So um, be sure to check that out. Um, again, creative mastery, it's on the Humanity Stream Plus platform. I checked this morning. I uh, always do when we bring a guest on, and there are 25 programs right now uh, that Barnett has on the Humanity Stream Plus platform. So, boy, and a wealth of wisdom. Be sure to check those out. So, Barnett, um, yeah, a lot to think about in that clip there, isn't there? A lot to revel in. Um, it's, you know, it's a... <clears throat> It's a glorious context uh, for living a life. And to the extent that we can attune to it and let it in, um, it affords ease and, and um, uh, a depth of satisfaction and, and connection with others. And it just, it just feels better. It's very much a different mindset than... Um, competing and comparing and contrasting and it's very much a different mindset which is this whole consciousness thing isn't it because comparing and trying to beat the lights out of the next person and you know these, we don't do these things we walk through that that consciousness door where we feel this connection and become more open-hearted and in service and we're creative and all of these things uh i love the direction you take it in which is you know, so in your relationship, I mean, creativity, right? I've been married uh, since uh, 1997. So, you know, and you can, you can just kind of ride that stale old wave if, if you don't want to be creative and see what the marriage brings. Or you can, you can get creative in every day, you know. Uh, and that's just one example. There's so many things that we can do in our lives that are creative, that are the spice of life, that... Uh, and, and I love in these other film clips that we will bring in uh, where you're going in the direction of really giving yourself that leash and latitude to feel into all of the possibilities that are out there, uh, which is creativity. It's not, it's not something from the past or from your grandparents, or, though that works too, you know, if it, as you mentioned. You know, if the, sometimes those things are great, and sure, they become the, a foundation under our feet. But a lot of times these things passed out are, you know, great. <laughs> Are, aren't great at all. You know, let them go. <laughs> yeah, you got so much yeah, wisdom there, here. There's, there's, 
there's hand-me-down ideas about who we are and what we are and what we're capable of. Uh, there's hand-me-down ideas uh, that come from the outside in. They come from our social conditioning and from our media and from our religious uh, um, community and from our political community and from our educational system. We uh, are sponges of hand-me-down material. And then how we arrange and rearrange those elements, you know, we call that a creative act. And it is a creative act. It's absolutely a creative act. And sometimes, you know, we we um, distill it down to saying, well, only this little piece is creative and only that little piece is creative. And even that's a creative act. And sometimes we uh, we build a life, we create a life out of these elements, following the shoulds and the woods and the the how we've been tra our trainings, we create a life. And sometimes, as you point out, that life may be a little, yeah, a little stale. That's a creative act. The uh, creative energy, the volition, the choice making, the resignation, all of these are, all of these are active. Even the ability to be mindful and to witness the inner narrative and the inner judge and the inner computer and just even to be a witness of how we construct those creative moments. That's a creative act. That requires being at the helm, being at the helm of your own um, experience and to be aware that you're the experiencer. That's a cre that's also a creative act. And so for me, uh, the, the great beauty um, that comes with reframing my relationship with creativity, creativity from, um, do, you know, from, a little kind of siloed experience in the same way we, we say, well, here's my marriage and here's me washing the dishes and here's me mowing the lawn and here's me painting a picture or writing a poem and that's creativity and that's my marriage. It's all creativity. There is only creativity going on. Consciousness, i.e. awareness, we become... Awareness is is the field. Awareness is the screen. I mean, there's so many um, there's so many ways to uh, analogies and metaphors for awareness. Uh, you know, I like to think of it as the sky. Awareness is the sky across which scudders clouds and birds, and these are. Um, some of them are our active creations, and some of them are are unfolding in our awareness without our sense of involvement. Nevertheless, we are the experiencers of it. And to the extent that we can begin to, um, cons to look at ourselves as the canvas, the sky across which every act, every thought, every feeling, every object occurs and our relationship to it um, now we understand is creative similar to how what happens when you wake up from a dream state at night you wake up in the morning and you realize well i was both inside the dream and um, also the maker of all that dream experience. I experienced it at two levels, from inside it as though I was in a subject-object relationship, and also in the light of day I realized I was the creator of all of it at some level that I'm not in touch with, and perhaps that is an indication of what's really uh, going on in our, in our daily experience. As we begin to um, look at our creativity in that way, which is what I, which is how I operate with it. Wonderful things happen all by themselves, seemingly. For example, 
all by itself, I tend to um, see other people in the world less as other and more as aspects of myself in this kind of dreamlike creative experience. At some level, I have an awareness that uh, I am one with every thought, everything, every one, every person, the tree outside. I'm one, and it begins to change how I feel, uh, what I say, what I do, in subtle ways. But over time, those ways are not so subtle. Now, I know I've said a lot there, Steve, so... Yeah, well, a, that's, uh, uh, that's beautiful. I love where you're ending up, and, and, and all of you, actually, that was quite a journey. Um, there was a lot to take in there, and, and then ending there was... Which, which is, this is what, when we say age of consciousness, is, this is one of its major dimensions, isn't it? That we're seeing others as aspects of ourself, the earth, you know, because this is what science is affirming now. We don't even have to take it from mystics anymore. Science is saying, you know, entanglement, everything is deeply affecting everything. You know, uh, there's no such thing as a separated self at all. Uh, the scientists are sharing this, you know, they're sounding, they're yeah. the modern day preachers that are out with their science. So. Let me bring in a question for you here from uh, the green room. This is right here in stream. So this is from Chad. Uh, he says, can you expand on how AI tools are helping or hampering content creators? Well, I, um, I can only comment on it from my very limited experience uh, with AI my sense of it is that it is like everything else. It is a tool. Um, it has a potential to um, democratize um, certain um, capabilities that were heretofore seen as um, um, the, the specialness domain of, of gifted individuals. And uh, I think that's wonderful. Unless one happens to be a gifted individual who, um, with an outsized ego, who thinks um, one's value is is wrapped up in one's specialness, and now it's democratized, so you're going to have some pushback there, and you're also going to have some pushback uh, from um, from people whose well, whose livelihoods are dependent upon the u the uniqueness of their ability to provide a good or a service. Uh, but that has always been the case when a new technology um, is onboarded or a new capacity. Um, that was the case when television supplanted radio when talkies uh, supplanted silent movies i mean that has always been the case and there are adaptations that are made um there will be abuses of the technology for sure there are, we, we've we're not strangers to those kinds of abuses and um fakes and but i see it overall as a um, as a positive contribution and uh, and um, a galloping acceleration of the age of consciousness. Once upon a time, you know, we lived in an industrial society where value was about uh, your ability to generate productivity for an owner, for a lord, for we were either it's serfs to the land or serfs in industry. And then we move through various kind of paradigms of, of society. And there was the, um, from the industrial age, we, we went to the information age and it was all about data. Well, we, we certainly blew through the information age uh, very quickly. I'm not sure what the pundits, uh, how they refer to our current times, but I refer to it as the age of consciousness, because it is very clear to me that uh, those who survive and who thrive uh, are those who have the ability to creatively respond to the challenges of an illusion outside and, and recognize it as such, not in a way that dismisses the experience as mere illusion, but that embraces all experience 
as a um, as illusory and mutable, and that our creative input matters. We matter, and we don't matter as a cog in the wheel. It's it's um, we we matter. We matter infinitely. Our input is critical. And to the degree that we understand how um, how we have levels of consciousness, first levels that are bounded by our psychological patterning. And those in a spiritual path or, or that are in, that are coming to a relationship with their own consciousness, very quickly realize, okay, the scaffolding of my thoughts and my beliefs and my choices and my, my decisions and my attitudes and my habituated feelings, they all knit together to create a certain menu of creative responses. They're not always productive responses, but they're always creative. They always have, they always have volition behind them choice behind them or automatic choice behind them. And these are psychological. And then there are uh, superseding there, there, you know, it doesn't end with your psychological responses. Once you understand your psychological responses, there's a certain kind of freedom not to try and master life, but to flow along with the mystery of life. Very different thing to try to beat life and outthink life than to uh, learn what are my conditioned reflexive responses so I could put the clutch in on them and perhaps create different responses to things and learn how to f from go from mastery to flowing with the mystery. And this is, this is the key to um, a expanded sense of um, volition and joy and excitement and creative oneness at oneness atonement this is this is the key to it and these are uh, going to be the leaders um, they're going to create models and be the map makers for those who um, see okay well there's a certain kind of freedom and a certain sanity that comes from understanding one's own relationship to to the all. This is more than ever why um, being conscious matters. Because if you continue to pretend that what you see and what you think and what you feel is an objective reality and corresponds to what once upon a time we quaintly thought of as the truth, you're in for a very difficult life. Uh -huh. So I don't think that these are problematic. I think this is simply the acceleration, that's the hockey stick end, of what it is uh, for people who um, have been living uh, in, a, in a story, in a narrative, that there is a subject-object universe and that we can uh, hack it and crack it and we can do it with our... We can outthink it. We can outproduce it. And AI uh, is a massively accelerated, exponentially accelerated uh, demonstration of what we can do with that and the repercussions of it. First and foremost, they show that it's illusion and you cannot trust any of it. So then what can you trust? If people don't begin to turn in at this point, then they're unfortunately going to be lost. Yeah, boy, that's a good, so your video clips get to uh, that turning in and what that one word is that we find as we turn mm -hmm. in. So let's go to the next video clip uh, and uh, we're going to come back and talk about it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Most of us have been conditioned to believe that conflict is indispensable to creativity. And I'm as responsible as anyone for that, along with all of my film industry colleagues. Mr. Freud had a bigger hand in it. When everything is a complex, we're reduced to being expressions of complexes. And yeah, that's often the case. 
For example, there are a lot of talented people. Think of stand-up comics, for instance, who rely on their neuroses for material. Carl Jung said that creativity is the expression of one of two functions. That it's either strictly representative, meaning literal reproduction, like representative painting, photography, documentary film, etc. Or visionary, which would be an expression of the underlying archetypes within us. Sufi whirling is a good example, Jackson Pollock. In my view, this point of view diminishes creativity because the artist is an agent, not a creator. Later, Abraham Maslow came along. Maslow would place creativity in his hierarchy of needs somewhere after the more pressing needs have been met, shelter and security, for example. I'll grant you, having that stake before you dance flamenco is understandable. But a little flamenco before you hunt the wild beast probably helps you manifest the animal in the first place. My point is that the dance itself is a creative act. In other words, it has generative energies. That's a big one to let in. That's why there's nothing casual about creativity. I'll go further. It's only through creative acts that we can rise above our conditioning. Picasso said, creativity is first of all an act of destruction. I think he was making exactly this point, that creativity first shatters our beliefs and assumptions about things, things we mostly take for granted. Let's look at how much we take for granted. If I asked you to draw me an alien from another dimension, I know you guys are all creative. You would definitely create something weird and wonderful, but probably vaguely humanoid. It might look like something from the bar scene in Star Wars. More than 99% of the time, that is what I see. Why not something that we wouldn't recognize as a life form at all? Because we are products of our families, schools, entertainments, and religions of other people's movies, TV, songs, stories, news, art, triumphs, and disasters. I call this structured imagining. The more creators are aware of our own structured imagining, the more power we have to create inside and outside of it. You can't sell a house that you don't own, etc. So start paying attention to your thoughts and feelings. Ask where did I get this? How much is hand-me-down thinking and feeling versus what's original with me? If you decide to keep any hand-me-downs, nothing bad or good about it. Just make sure they work for you. And always, always be willing to give it up if something more valuable to you shows up. Okay, boy, you know, again, a lot of wisdom there. Uh, so this is, again, creative mastery. This is a master class Barnett Bain created with James Twyman. Uh, it's on Stream Plus. There are 25 programs right now on Stream Plus uh, that, we're, uh, that Barnett is in. So be sure to check them out. Uh, you can get, you know, you these little one and two minute videos. There's just a whole wealth of wisdom there, isn't there? So imagine what the master class holds. Um, I love that little clip. Um, this example you brought in of uh, where the, um, you know, in, as we were in our academic uh, going through college, they would say, well, we need to learn this and this and this before we could even think about being creative. But you're saying, no, if we turn it around, you know, the, and do some whirling, isn't that going to maybe contribute to the, you know, the, uh, as you described it, sort of that uh, animal or that thing that we're creating. So, uh, well, it's causal. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I believe that it's causal. And um, as you pointed out earlier, uh, scientists and physicists uh, are now coming to as if they discovered the idea that it's that they, as if they discovered the idea of resonance. And, um, you know, people in the consciousness community have uh, long understood uh, that uh, resonance is causal. 
uh, that um, if somebody in the chat pointed out, you know, an attitude of gratitude is causal. It is a, an octave of manifestation. It is an octave. I, I prefer to think of it in terms of it's an octave of the dream state. There is a there are certain um, um, frequencies uh, tied to a, an emotional scale, um, and if one uh, is dreaming at a in uh, in energies of anger, there's a certain kind of dream, and energies of self pity provides a, is another um, man, is another canvas for another kind of dream. Uh, the energies, the emotions are are a canvas. That's the sky across which the the clouds float. And if one has is conscious enough to understand that, um, very fre most frequently, our uh, thoughts and feelings about what comes up in the living of life, they are rarely about now. Unless I'm standing in the street and a truck is coming at me, that whatever I'm feeling there, whatever that thought is, is about now. But generally, the, what comes up are interruptions to my sense, to my experience of flow in the presence. They're interruptions because something comes up that is either familiar or remotely the same or similar to something in my past. And... Um, these these early experiences or traumas, or these earlier upsets, or sometimes these early joys, they are held in the body. They're not literally held in in uh, in a memory file cabinet, but they're held in something similar. They're held as frequencies in the body, and they when something similar or familiar comes up, they. They they attune to some harm. It's almost like a harmonic when you you know when orchestras tune to a C and everybody is strings now in the in the string instruments begin to vibrate and so what happens is something similar keys a memory and an experience and a thought and now I've I've been pitched out of the present and I'm into the past. When we become conscious of this. We have an active hand in the creation. We have, we're now on board on a whole other level, a whole other octave of our ability to create and co-create. A whole other level. I'm able to say, this is not a feeling or the, an emotion that is, they're all causal. This is not a feeling or an emotion that is in, about now. It's an old thought and it's an old feeling. And I can lovingly let it go. And now attuned to my, I now have the age self agency to attune to a sense of well being or beauty or or grat or gratitude, but only if I have the self awareness to understand what is really going on, what automatic programs are are, are running here, and can I be responsive to them, beat by beat, moment by moment? Can I increase my muscle, my capacity to creatively respond to the uh, flow of thought and feeling and to the interruptions to them that take me out of the present and into the past. That, again, that is a, it's a, it's a level of consciousness that allows us to the earlier point, that allows us to have agency and to be responsive to a world that is not uh, reliable in the to our senses in the same way that it used to be even a few short years ago, and going looking forward into the next ten years, if we think it's weird now, wait to you know cast forward. I've seen some things that um, that are hair raising if you have no consciousness. There's no such thing as privacy any, uh, anymore. No such thing as being able to trust um, the evidence of of your eyes anymore. So what can you trust? It requires a different creative palette, which 
is built on the shoulders, stands on the shoulders of a certain kind of um, baseline psychological sophistication. On the shoulders of that unfolds something called spirituality. So all these things, they're not inherently bad unless one's a Luddite or a fundamentalist. Then it's, it's, it's hugely scary. Uh, if one is on a consciousness path, it's okay. Well, you have training wheels on. I'm going to take off one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are no victims here. This is one of what I believe one of why humanity's team among, and there are other there are other communities like it, why it matters. Why does it matter so much? It's not just because it is a, um, uh, an inst a place of higher learning. There are a lot of places of higher learning. It's community. It's community. More than ever, if one is going to learn how to operate consciously, to move um, the modality of being operating at the effect of a pretend that what's outside is real, to shift that to a, an understanding of oneness, the rule book, the operating manual is entirely different. And it requires, you can't do that in Plato's cave. It requires a community. This is why, this is the purpose of marriage once upon a time. It requires a community. That required a, a community of two, at least to balance raw animal ego. Now we require a larger community of um, aligned spirits, people who are operating in a bandwidth, a layer of the cake that is accountable to itself with a certain kind of sophistication regarding esoteric matters, psychological matters, a certain layer of that cake you need a community to reinforce, to help correct, to um, up level your, you know, just by by association to up level your own um, sense of confidence, your own sense of appreciation, your own sense of I I am not alone in the world. I am I am not. It's not about me trying to crack something. It's not a. It's not. It's not a me thing. It's a we thing. You need community. Yeah, amen. So, and thank you for that. And uh, we do. Yeah, conscious community. Boy, what a beautiful thing. And um, I always, but at this time in the world where, you know, candidly, we're all you know, kind of pioneers with this. Uh, we, we haven't reached tipping points. So, we're, where we can be in community. And sometimes people's spouses aren't even, you know, uh, on this conscious journey or their kids aren't and their coworkers aren't. And so sometimes people can kind of feel like they're on an, on an island with this and where we can come together. And uh, as you know, like uh, when doing your master class in that first cohort, we, uh, we had viewing parties, which is, you know, you got a hundred people sitting there uh, saying, Oh, wow. Well, you know, this, I got this out of it. And I had, this is the question that stands out for me. It's a really cool thing, you know, where you've got uh, all these kindred spirits that are, looking at it uh, and uh, uh, sharing kind of what was profound for them and what questions they have. Let me, speaking of questions, let me go to one. Uh, there's a couple here I want to get to. We still have another clip that's really fantastic. We'll get to shortly too. So, um, so Leslie says, she's out on uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, and she says, what are some methods of unlocking creative blocks? And of course, that was why you created that masterclass with... Uh, with James Twyman, you know, called Creative Mastery. But if you just just a real high level, how what are some suggestions to kind of unlock creative blocks that we that we all have? Well, there are all kinds all kinds of creative blocks. Um, most of them have to do with our um, habits and our belief systems. So if I believe I have a creative block. Um, that then I'm operating inside a little soap bubble of uh, I have a creative block. <laughs> um, it's pro creative block. What are what are referred to as creative blocks? I hold as um, process. This is process. Um, 
So I am uh, engaged as it happens right now. I have um, um, a book that uh, is underway and I have a, a new screenplay. I would love to be racing through it. I'd love to be done in two weeks, um, but that's not the process. Um, and there are uh, more aspects of me involved in the creation of these things than I have, you know, there, there are more aspects of me than, than I'm aware of. And so a lot of it is uh, cooking subconsciously and, Sometimes I feel the best thing that I can do is uh, go for a walk or go skiing or go to the beach. And um, yeah, my ego would like to just power through it. Um, that's a, a control thing. I would just want to be in control. I want to power through it so I can get to, so I can get. When I have a block, it's, it's, in, it's an oppositional energy. I want this. It's blocked. Uh, what is it that you want? Um, whatever it is that you want, I want so that I can, so that I can. Whatever that is, it has um, nothing to do with flow. And so some of being uh, conscious about what my blocks are is to first identify that, well, it's a belief structure. I don't necessarily have to know what the belief structure is, but I do know that I, it is a mindset that is holding it as an interruption uh, to uh, my um, to my wish, <laughs> to, to my desire. So it's a control issue. And um, there's nothing in your life that you uh, can control. You can't control ultimately your aging, ultimately your health. There's nothing you can control except in tiny little bits. So it's an opportunity to um, dial into a certain kind of sense of humility. You're in partnership with something. I guess the short form is find ways to um, counteract your desire to control things. Perhaps it's breath, perhaps it's exercise, perhaps it's a walk outside, perhaps it's simply taking, sitting down and taking stock of yourself. But this is a spiritual practice. The reality is everything is a spiritual practice when you get to this point. And so there's no such thing as what can I do about a, a block? That is, you, you know, you're operating you're on this call, we're operating at a certain layer of the cake. What can I do about a block? I think you already know what to do about a block. I mean, it's, it's a different layer of the cake. It's really, you're really asking, what do I do about my desire to control an outcome? That's a different and a much more empowering question. And there are remedies to that. Breath, nature, love, humility, patience. Uh, changing the nature of your relationship to whatever it is that you're creating that you feel blocked in? Are you trying to dominate it or are you trying to co-create it? I mean, it has an energy of its own. There's a lot to be said there. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, no, that was that was super helpful. You you know, again, boy, you know, you cover real terrain when you respond. There's uh, we go on a journey and a lot of ground there. Um, you know, I was just thinking for me, um, the kind of thing I do is this work is really not about me or it's not about Neil Donald Walsh or, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, my mother-in-law so many years ago called it a, she, she called it a God job. So, um, and, uh, so I, I always kind of feel like there's this wind at my back, you know, that's kind of trying to take me to the higher ground. And if I get blocked, it's going to. You know, I'll have, I mentioned, you know, Ken Honda, who's a, a dear friend of, of both of ours, uh, came out to the house for a week and we uh, recorded a master class with him. And it's all kind of wisdom that he dropped in. And, it, you know, I think that's sort of, if there's something I need to know, then uh, I'll come on a call with Barnett and Barnett will share it. <laughs> or uh, Ken will come visit and he'll share it. You know, that the universe is just, uh, is trying to blow wind into our sail. Where, where we've got these, this higher purpose, which is part of what conscious living is, is it, 
is uh, this higher purpose. It's also one word, which uh, we got to get to the next video because there, here Barnett brings in the one word that it's all about. Let's go take a look at it and we'll come back. Here we go. Every story is a love story. Every creation, a love affair. How so, you say? No matter how we categorize or describe the creations of our lives, comic, action adventure, coming of age, fantasy, harrowing or tragic, hopeful, overcoming or inspirational, each and every act of creativity is about relationship. Think about the movies, businesses, and books that we love the most. Imagining ourselves as protagonists, when we boil it all down, what are we doing in these creations? We're always trying to find our way back to somewhere or someone, isn't that so? We're simultaneously trying to find our way back to some truth, something that reconnects us to the meaning and purpose of it all. Sure, a whole lot more is happening too. We may be looking for the light after long periods of darkness. We may be seeking to forgive and be forgiven, to finally be free from hurt, blame, or regrets from the past. But at the root of all our choices, no matter how beautiful or depraved, is a motive. And beneath that motive is another motive, and another, and another, until eventually it always, always, comes down to wanting to give or receive one thing, love. It's that yearning for relationship that makes everything, every step and every misstep, every hour and every epoch worthwhile. It's the relationship with each other, with nature, with life and with ourselves that is the basis and heart of every creative act. Boy, so that's uh, another one for the refrigerator. Yeah, one word that's the nature of, create, of, uh, of every creative act. <laughs> Love, which isn't that true? I mean, that really is true, isn't it, Barnett? I, I believe it. I feel it. I feel it deeply. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what to add to that. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. to add to that. I mean. <laughs> right. That is, that the is, only, I mean, that's they, the only thing that's going on and our, <laughs> all, of, all of the struggle and strife of life has to do with the strategies that we build up to uh, deal with, to control, to uh, handle a response to being separated from the love. And right. I keep bringing this back um, because I think it's the most important takeaway that we can have at this time. This is the age of consciousness. As we lean into that, what becomes apparent is the, the oneness of all things. And the paradigm of we live in a world begins to, it's not something if I, I learned my seven steps and now I, I'm not doing that. It begins by itself to dissolve. All by itself, what becomes more and more weighted is uh, some mystery. It's not replaced by a new set of facts. It's some mystery. But what goes away is I'm in a subject-object world. That's just by itself starts to go away and if there's only if there is one thing going on looking at itself and it's me i um i have an experience of love that is um total it changes everything so why is creativity important it's another way of saying love. Creativity is love's work. Creativity is love's work. Whether it shows up in your relationships with friends, family, the world, self, 
kindness. Kindness, compassion, they are a natural outflow. You don't have to strive for them. You don't have to learn how to be it, to learn how to do it. If I become lucid in my dream, I stop fighting with my... I start fighting with who, with whoever's in the dream with me. It just, it just bends it all by itself. I don't need steps. It matters. You matter. I matter. It's a different ball game. Different rules. It's different. And the first thing to begin to dissolve away are the old rules. And it becomes reflected in the world outside us. There's a reason that AI is dissolving, you know, ready or not. Not everyone's ready. So the response that that can open in you uh, is many possible responses, but it is very likely that compassion will open first. If you're in the deeper you lean into the consciousness, your heart will break. It'll be excited and your heart will break all at the same time. Because it's going to be thrilling. And it's going to be nightmarish. And it's all you. It's complicated. Yeah. Nobody said it was easy. <laughs> but it's certainly creative. Yeah, it is. I'm going to come back to creative because there's a question on that uh, here. I'm going to bring to you in, one, in a second. But um, you, you said as you were sharing, you know, that it's co coming home to love, which which is, you know, kind of my experience is, you know, we grow up in this sort of knock the lights out world if you're an entrepreneur or, or in sports or, or whatever. Um, and a lot of times that's not, you know, that's not a you're, we're not coming home to love when we do that. And uh and that often is what causes some of this internal strife and, and loneliness yeah. and challenge and chaos and all of that. Uh, but then uh, this conscious journey is where we do, we, we, we come back to love. Something draws us in. Uh, and then, boy, it's just like a warm fire. You're just like, oh, my God, you know, where have I been? <laughs> it's sort of like when you're skiing, you know, and it's just freezing out. And you come in to grab uh, your lunch, and there's just this warm, crackling fire going and you sit near it, and boy, it's just heavenly. And it's it's kind of like that. Um, it's yeah. definitely like that. And it's not love as we thought it was, as we knew it. It's not the love that we thought. It's very much something else. The love that we thought comes along. So we're not losing anything. It comes along. But the... The the oneness is a um, is a superseding uh, experience of love. It comes along. Yeah, I'm. I I really get what you're saying. A superseding because it is a whole. It's an unconditional love. We're not, of course, we're not talking about romantic love here. It's a it's a whole different thing. It's sort of like a God love of just. It's unconditional. It's always there. Uh, it, it's just something that we can choose to let in or not because it's always here, actually. That's what oneness is. It means there's no separation. It's actually always here. But we just don't let it in, you know, until we come home to it. Uh, so let me bring, um, so here's a question. Uh, and boy, this, I told you this hour would go fast. So we're down to, gosh, only about five more minutes. Uh, so this is from Chad. And Chad says, inspiration so where does it come from? Does it come from ego? Does it come from higher guidance? Does it come from both? Where, where does inspiration come from? Chad asks. All of it. Doesn't matter to me where it comes <laughs> from. I'll take it wherever it comes from. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to, in the most gentle possible way, I'm going to suggest that the question comes from well if i mean why are you asking that what what how is that question helpful it's if if it's a question that you think well that might be a, helpful for me to um so that i can use it in a particular way 
then again, it's a control thing. It's like, oh, could you, if I just get this one more piece, I can nail it. <laughs> so um, it is a question wanting to know, wanting to know. At some point, we we want to stop wanting to know. If only, can you, wanting to know if I could just find this teacher. At some point, we put a pin in it. Those are um, uh, fulfillments of certain kinds of developmental psychological. If I could just know, if I could just know, uh, you know, there's a child that lives not too far away from here. And it's just like, I've never heard so many questions. That's developmentally appropriate. And then you get, there is a now a layer of development that is not about, I want to know, I want to know. It's about experience. It's no longer mastery. It's mystery. It's about flowing through. You're no longer the creator. You're no longer crushing it. You're no longer hacking. You know, it's this is all developmental. It's perfect. That is not the consciousness tier. And many come to consciousness as well. If I can just, you know, use the, some tool, get some more tools out of my consciousness thing. I can find a parking space. I find a partner, make a million dollars. Those are also fine and developmental. One hopes that eventually, um, as you lean into what is really going to be unpacked in that creative life in that conscious life what these these things they they crumble that's they crumble they they lose their luster we we bend into flowing through an experience is this and questions come up like who am i what are my am i my roles am i my interests and my my talents and my perhaps and i don't have an answer for this currently I, I what satisfies me the most although i that's still not an answer is that i am the ex, i'm an experiencer that's it i'm an experiencer and um what pitches me out of an experience is the asking of questions that takes me back down into a world of subject and object. Now I'm now I'm trying to outthink life again. So I encourage you to, uh, if there are questions that need to be asked, certainly ask them and be willing to be through with that. You don't have to know. Why am I lovable? Why am I here? Why are you lovable? Because this, 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 yeah. And then when the blindness come off, you're me. Not as a concept. So, um, ask yourself why you're asking the question. And then put it in its place. If it's something you really need, like which is the way, what is the way to the airport? I'm with you. Why is there an airport? It's above my pay grade. Where does insight come from? It's above my pay grade. And I'm not interested in asking those questions. I hope that's yeah, helpful. A lot to, yeah. I mean, this, uh, you know, with Sharon in the intro, you know, you teach at these colleges, including Columbia. Columbia is one of the best colleges in the country. Uh, you know, this was a, a while back, I think. Uh, where they created this master's program that brought in spirituality. So I can see why. I mean, you really go, you, uh, you, you go into the, uh, just take, take people in a very thoughtful directions that bring in history, uh, spirituality, psychology, creativity. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really very thoughtful, very profound. So I want to thank you. Uh, well, a huge round of applause here for uh, Barnett Bain. Thank you so much, Barnett, for being with us. I see people, you look at in the studio, they're, they're clapping. Thank you. <laughs> wow. This was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks so much for being with us. You'll, uh, we're going to stay close to Barnett. He's uh, a dear friend of humanity's team. Um, 
boy, this, uh, he's got an incredible master class. Other uh, things to come, because uh, I'm sure there's, uh, we, we've already talked about other partnership possibilities that are out in the future. Right now, he's got a, uh, an amazing movie he's working on, and uh, we'll talk about that when it's ready and to, to go and in, uh, coming into theaters here. So, so thank you so much. And uh, viewers, thank you all for being here. Of course, the whole reason for this discussion is, uh, I mean, it's fantastic for me to sit here and talk with Barnett. My God, what would I rather do, right? Uh, but it's, it's this wisdom, right? It's the conscious journey. It's the age of consciousness. That's why we're having the discussion, because we're leaning into it. We're stretching into it. We're all on that journey, right? Uh, there's no destination. It's an ascending stairwell. We just keep climbing higher into it. And of course, it feels delicious. Uh, and our lives become uh, amazing as we're climbing that ascending stairwell. Uh, so I know that there are tools here that Barnett has provided that is that's supporting that uh, climbing of that ascending stairwell. Thank you so much, Barnett, for that. And viewers, uh, hey, together we can and we are. Uh, and this whole you know compassionate, sustainable, flourishing world, which is uh, our destination, we're saying, saying make conscious living pervasive worldwide by 2040. Uh, we can and we will do that. And, uh, of course, uh, mainstream media isn't talking a lot about it, but that's okay. Uh, they will, and, we're, and we're, on our, we're well on our way during this journey. So and we'll see you back live again next week. Before we go off the air, I wanna, we're going to pull the camera back because I want to just acknowledge Jim Gray, who uh, is here in the studio. There's Jim over there, uh, me on the couch. Jim, thank you, and another masterpiece here, pulling in uh, these, uh, these uh, little video clips going out on social media with, with the help of partners. So we've got Nanette Kennedy, D. Meyer, uh, Garth Catterall, a lot of uh, my, my partners and colleagues that help make this possible, bring all this stuff back, and then Jim, make sure we don't go down. So thank you guys. Much appreciated. Another great, uh, another great program. And we'll be back with you live next Wednesday, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. Thanks for being with us, and uh, let's live into it here in the next week. Love and peace and blessings, everybody. Okay, great to be with you. <laughs>